So today's video is going to be another true crime video and today's case is my most requested case in the history of my channel, like ever. So, so, so many of you guys have been requesting this case for literally months. But today we are gonna be talking about the tragic murder of James Bulger. And before I get into it, I just wanna say, if you are sensitive at all to violent deaths or child deaths, please just don't watch this video. It's gonna be too much for you. It is a really hard hitting case, it's really sad. I know a lot of you guys that are subscribed to my channel can't watch the kind of child, the videos about children, which I totally understand. This video is not gonna go into detail, so don't worry about that. But still, if you don't wanna, if you don't wanna watch this video, that's completely fine, just click out now. Before I get started, I just want to give my usual disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this video. This is all just information that I have found on the internet and I'm compiling into one video. So James Patrick Bulger, also known as Jamie Bulger, was born on March the 16th, 1990 and he was two years old, just a couple of weeks off of his third birthday at the time of his murder. He lived in Liverpool in Merseyside in England with his mother Denise Bulger, who is now Denise Fergus. Um, and I'm unsure whether he lived with his father, Ralph Bulger, at the time. He was a gorgeous little boy. He was very friendly, very cheeky, very social. He was just a lovely little boy. On the 12th of February 1993, Denise Bulger, her son James and Denise's friend all went to the Strand, which was an indoor shopping centre. They walked around for a while, they did a little bit of shopping, and then Denise and James went to the Butcher's at around 3.40pm. Denise let go of James's hand for a matter of less than a minute, just to kind of get the money out of her purse, hand it to the cashier, get the change, put it back in, and when she looked back down to take hold of his hand again, James had gone. So his mum immediately starts panicking. She's looking around the shop, she's looking outside the shop, frantically just trying to find her son. So the shopping centre put a routine call out for missing children, for like people to report any sightings or bring him to the front desk or whatever. This wasn't an uncommon thing to happen in a shopping centre. I mean, there's toy shops, there's sweet shops. Kids like often just go wandering from their parents. It's not it, it's not an unusual thing to happen. But this announcement fed back nothing. No one came to the desk to say that they'd seen James, no one brought him in, and the manual search that his mum and other staff were doing, that also came back nothing, and so police were contacted. It wouldn't have entered your mind that he'd have been taken by anybody, but all they were concerned was for his safety and where he was. Because it was a busy road, and he could have easily been knocked over. As time by the search extended beyond the shopping centre because obviously the more time that goes by the further James could have gotten and so people started to search the streets nearby the shopping centre. We searched near canals because you always think he might have fallen in. We go and search derelict yards, scrap areas. It's a quite industrial area. It was such a vast area to sort of search really. Meanwhile Denise, James's mother, was taken to the police station. I had police to walk in the room and I holding a pair of shoes in front of my face and I was shaking my head now, not his. And that was a sigh of, you know, kind of relief then when them shoes wearing James's. But still that night, nobody had come forward to say that they'd seen anything. And at this point, it was really worrying. It was really looking like an abduction at this point. The next morning, it had been almost 24 hours since anyone had last seen James. And Denise and her family had been at the police station the whole time, almost 24 hours. Um, and that was when police finally got their first lead. The shopping center had looked over their CCTV footage and they found a clip of a toddler leaving the premises of the shopping centre with two young boys. And um, we assessed the ages to be about 14, 15. Although it wasn't clear, because the films get turned over by day, it's poor visibility. The CCTV footage was really bad, very unclear, although Denise could still identify James due to the outfit that he was wearing that day. And I knew straight away it was James. The thought, I've got a perfect chance of getting him back here. There was words going now that they could be classing him as a brother, you know, a brother that they've wanted and they've probably got him in a shed somewhere feeding him sweets and you know, looking after him. Initially, this comforted Denise and the rest of the Bulgers, knowing that he'd gone off in the company with two young boys. Like, the chances of getting him back were pretty high and their intentions were probably not malicious, 
Whereas if they'd seen him leave with like a middle-aged man on the CCTV footage, you can imagine the intentions and you can imagine the chances of getting him back weren't going to be very high. Were they playing some kind of game with him perhaps? Was he being held hostage or was he being kept by them somewhere as a playmate or had some harm being done to him? So as with most missing children's cases, Denise took to the news to give a public appeal to try and get whoever had James to bring him back. Denise, what is your, your appeal to the public? If you've got me baby, just bring them back. But despite this, and despite the CCTV images being made public, nothing really came back. We had these two boys and we had to find them. It was assessed that we had to look for boys within an age range of 10 to 18, but we concentrated more or less looking at boys who were about 14. All local police were contacted to see if they had any young children on file that had been in trouble before that might fit the description of these two boys on the CCTV footage. You interviewed local police officers and asked them who do they suspect that would be these children. I was unfortunately in an area where a lot of children were always in trouble and there was a lot of names put forward. But despite all the appeals and the whole of Liverpool searching for this little boy, the next day Denise received the worst news she could possibly get. Protected under a police tent lies the body of a young boy, found this afternoon by children playing on a railway embankment. Two days after his disappearance, James Bulger's body was found on a railway line, and it was actually found by a group of children. We were found by children, not by adults and those kids must be still affected today as a result of what they saw. So now this investigation turned to a manhunt for two young boys that are now possible murder suspects. That moved the story to a new depth, shall we say, of uh, shock and dismay. And by now, the world's press were descending on Liverpool and the eyes of the world were on Liverpool. Magazine editors offered their services to police to try and clear up these images of the CCTV footage I mean, the whole of Liverpool was coming together to try to solve this. We were still looking at age range 14 to 18. You know, evil sort of children that could have committed it. In an attempt to try and get members of the public to come forward with any information they might have, police released the details of James's last steps. From where James was abducted to where he was found, it must be nearly three miles. A long way to walk a young child. But where James was found, they had to climb up the side of a railway bridge, which was very near to Walton Lane Police Station. Officers questioned over 60 young boys around the ages of 14, 15, 16, because that is how old police believed these two boys on the CCTV footage to have been. And just a side note, one of these innocent boys that they questioned out of this 60, he actually had to flee Liverpool with his whole family because he was getting threats from so many people that knew he'd been questioned and thought that he was guilty, although he was innocent, but he still had to flee because of threats. After a few days, a woman contacted police saying that she'd just seen this CCTV footage on the news and she actually recognised one of the boys. She said that this boy had actually skipped school that day with his friend. And I mean, there were two boys on this CCTV footage during school time as well. So all the other kids were in school. So what are the chances that these two boys skipped school together and there were two boys on the CCTV footage? So this was an immediate lead. I was called to brief officers to arrest two young boys. One had been seen to have paint on his shoes. Paint, along with other items that we'll talk about later, were actually found at the crime scene. But the boys that were being accused were just 10 years old, both of them, whereas police believed that the boys in the CCTV footage were like 14, 15, so they didn't believe it 100% at first. They were originally just going to the house to question them and then be able to eliminate them as suspects. So when they said 10 year old boys, you think, oh well, it's gotta be done. Information's come in. So we've got to go and see him and interview him. But you were expecting him. That, that, you know, they could possibly be the ones? Oh, no, I didn't. 
I don't think the other detectives did as well. So a team of officers went to speak to 10 year old John Venables, who was the boy that the woman recognised from the CCTV footage. And a separate team of officers went to speak to Robert Thompson, who was also 10 years old and John Venables' friend. Said, Robert, I'm here because of Jamie's murder. He says, yeah, no. She said, but we've been told that you might be involved in it. Then he started sort of panicking. Phil then told Robert that he was arresting him and taking him to the police station for further questioning. And told him what I was there for and the fact I was arresting him. And then he started crying. But it wasn't tears there, it was just, it, they were crocodile tears. I was, I was taken back a bit. So both Thompson and Venables were taken to separate police stations for questioning. The first thing I noticed about John is that he looked far younger than the 10 years that he was uh, in actual fact. He looked like an eight year old, little cherubic, angelic looking face. So before we carry on with the kind of story and the questioning, the police questioning and stuff, I want to give you a little bit of background on Thompson and Venables and kind of their upbringing and stuff. So we'll start with Robert Thompson. He was one of seven children, so it was a huge family. Um, and it's believed that his father, also called Robert Thompson, used to beat his mother, Anne, before eventually starting an affair with a woman that he met on a family holiday with the rest of the Thompsons. And his dad made no attempt to hide this affair from the family either. He even told his wife, Anne, that if she had a problem with it, if she complained about it, then he'd just leave. He'd just leave her and the kids. He rarely spoke to his wife and kids as it was anyway, spending most of his time either at the pub drinking or with this other woman. Eventually, he did leave Anne and all seven of his sons to go off with this other woman and he actually left Anne five pounds, which is all he contributed to all seven of his children's upbringing. Other than that, the Thompsons never saw their father again other than one occasion at his mother's funeral when Robert was just six years old. And even then, his dad didn't speak to any of his kids. It was then Robert's mother Anne turned to alcoholism and all seven kids were pretty much left to fend for themselves and their emotional and physical needs just weren't being met. Just seven weeks after their father left them, all of the Thompson family were out for the day and when they returned home, they found that their house had burnt down. And so all eight of them had to spend two months in a hostel. Eventually, after these two months, the Thompsons were rehoused into a tiny little terrace house for all eight of them. Seven young boys and their mother in a tiny little terrace house. And this was when Anne's alcoholism just got so much worse. She started keeping a bottle of alcohol under her pillow so she could drink it last thing at night, first thing in the morning. So the Thompson kids now not getting enough attention. I mean, one parent is now gone. One parent is an alcoholic. They're just not getting enough attention that children need. And so they all started acting up. They all started getting into trouble constantly. Social workers were constantly coming to the house. Anne hated it that social workers were coming to the house and just nothing changed. Eventually the boys started bullying each other as well. Like the older ones would bully the younger ones and so on and so on until it got to the youngest. Um, and they would all skip school. Sometimes because they wanted to skip school and sometimes because the older brothers would threaten the younger ones saying that they would beat them if they did go to school. In one term alone, Robert missed 49 out of a possible 140 days in school. So that is over a third of the time in one term that he missed. And because he was missing so much work, he was getting behind, he wasn't on the same level as the rest of his classmates and so he was held back a year in school. Oftentimes when he would miss school, Robert would go out and shoplift. Sometimes stealing things for his baby brothers and for his mum to try and help the family out because they were a poor family. She was a single mum looking after seven boys. Like, they didn't have a lot. And so Robert sometimes would steal toys for himself as well because he, they didn't have much. Like I said, the older brothers would abuse the younger brothers, often tying them up, locking them in the pigeon shed outside. And one time one of the older brothers even pulled a knife on one of the others. On one occasion during an argument, Anne Thompson actually hit one of her children. And so he called the social services and asked for them to take him away. And so they did. They came and they took two of the boys away, both of which later in life attempted suicide. In 1993, one of Robert's younger brothers was found wandering alone around the Strand. 
that same shopping centre where James Bulger was abducted from. He was scared, he was crying, and when someone asked him what had happened, he said that his older brother Robert and his friend, not John Venables, a different friend, had taken him to the Strand shopping centre, kicked him and left him there and gone home. And that's about it for Robert Thompson's childhood up until the point of James Bulger's abduction. A pretty horrific childhood, honestly. So now for John Venables. He was one of three siblings. He had a younger sister and an older brother, both of which had learning disabilities. Although John himself didn't have any disabilities, he would adapt some of the behaviours that his brother and sister were showing onto himself. John's father, Neil, believed in very traditional family roles. He believed it was up to him to go out and get a job and earn money for the family. Meanwhile, his wife, Susan, John's mother, should be at home looking after the children, which was a lot of work for Susan. She had three children, two of which had special needs due to their disabilities, and it was just a lot of work for her. This meant that she would often spend a lot of time with John's brother and sister because they required extra care than John did. Um, although she maintains that she looked after them all, cared for them, loved them equally. Although you can imagine that John sometimes was swept to the side a little bit. When John was just one year old, his mother Susan's father died. And so now her mother needed extra care because her husband was no longer there. So Susan took all three kids and moved in with her mother. John's father Neil got his own place. It's not clear why he didn't move in with the rest of them although they claimed to still have been together, just living in separate houses. They eventually moved into a new house, but John was pretty badly bullied by the children in the neighbourhood. They used to shout things at him, throw things at him, and make fun of him for his siblings being backwards. This led him to misbehaving, he was clearly distressed, he used to cry a lot, and his schoolwork suffered due to this. He would sit in class, rocking backwards and forwards, mumbling and making noises. He would throw things off the desk. He would bang his head really hard against the desk, like enough to cause pain. And obviously this was disrupting the rest of the children in the class from learning. And John would sit at his desk and cry because of the bullying. And like I said, it was all just really affecting John's classwork. And so his mother was called in. Susan told the school that she was having the exact same problems with John at home. He would be abusive to her and he expressed multiple times that he didn't want to be in his school He wanted to be with his brother and sister at their school It's been theorised that him acting out, hitting his head on the table, rocking backwards and forwards Was him imitating his brother and sister's behaviour To try and trick people around him into thinking that he also had like learning disabilities or whatever to try and get put into their school for people that needed extra care. It's also been theorised that he wanted to move into that school in the first place because he thought bullying just didn't exist in that school. I mean, it was a lot more tolerant. They had a lot of different people with like unique differences and he just thought that if he moved to that school with his brother and sister, he wouldn't be bullied anymore. But John's behaviour only got worse. He started pulling displays off walls. He would hide under the tables where no one could reach him. He would harm himself with scissors in class. And eventually he just got banned from going on school trips because he was that much of a disruption. One day, John even tried to strangle another student with a ruler. And it actually took two teachers to get him off of this other boy. And because of this incident, John Venables was suspended from school for two days. Although, as a form of punishment, his mother kept him away from school for 10 weeks. And at this point, he'd missed so much school. He was such a disruption while he was there that he just had to move schools. And when he did, they put him back a year, putting him into Robert Thompson's class. And Thompson and Venables got talking while they were in class. I mean, they were both older than everyone else in their year. So it was just kind of meant to be that they were going to be friends. Although John did try to stay away from Robert at first because he said that he was trouble, but eventually they became best friends anyway. Thompson's bad behaviour of skipping school and stealing and all that kind of stuff began to rub off onto Venables. Both boys' mothers were alcoholics, both boys' mothers attempted suicide, both boys didn't really have a father figure, both of them were bullied, they were both put back a year in school, like they just had so much in common, they were just meant to be best friends 
and that is what is so creepy about this story. And that brings us to the day that they were arrested and they were taken to separate police stations for questioning. Robert Thompson in his first questioning told police that it was John Venables, like it was just all John Venables. He was the one that grabbed James to take him, he was, it was his idea, it was all John Venables. He, he grabbed the baby's hand and just walked around the strand. And then Thompson starts getting emotional, saying that he was begging Venables to take the baby back. I told him to take him back. You did as well? I told him to take him back. You told him to take him back? I don't know right, the blame. No, you're not getting all the blame. We're just asking your son. We're yes, trying to find Bobby, the truth. Yes, we always get the blame. Wait a minute, Bobby. Listen. <laughs> But other than that, Thompson was very hard to question, very hard for police to get anything out of. He would often lie and he wouldn't tell police a full story. It was like stopping, starting. Yeah, I admit going so far with him, then I left him. And then when we produced other evidence, well, well, you've been seen on the reservoir talking to an old woman. Oh yes, after that, we just left him after that. And then, well, you've been seen after that. Yeah, well, once I'd been there, I left him there. And once police managed to get Thompson to admit to being on the railway that day, he once again just blamed everything on Venables. Venables did it all. Robert just didn't do anything. Meanwhile, in Venables' interview, which was going on parallel to Thompson's right at the same time, Venables was lying to police, saying that he wasn't even at the shopping centre that day. He wasn't even in Liverpool. He was miles away. But on his second day of interviews, police told him that Robert had admitted that they were both there on the railway that day. Suddenly there was silence and he said, yes, we were in the Strand, but honestly, Mum, we never grabbed a kid and there was the most terrible wailing and he jumped out of his seat, very tactile boy, and he hugged the police officers and he hugged his mum and he was screaming and crying. We didn't harm a child. We never grabbed a kid, Mum. In his interviews with police, all Venables ever had to say was, we never. Did you take the boy? We never. Did you hurt the little boy? We never. The strand, and that you saw the little boy? We never. We never. Is that the God's honest truth? God's honest truth, I'm, I'm telling you that we never. We're... And then Venables got equally as fake emotional as Thompson did in his interviews. Oh, no, it's all right. Come on, bro. It's all right. Come on. All nice. I never got the boy. I never killed someone. That night, John Venables' solicitor went home and decided to re-watch the CCTV footage of the day of James's disappearance. When I could clearly see that little boy being walked out of the shopping precinct by two boys, one of whom, which looked like Venables, wearing a mustard-coloured coat. So I couldn't wait to get in there the next morning. First thing I said to him, what colour's your coat? And he said mustard. And my heart just sank. So now they knew for sure that the boys had done something, but they needed a confession, and so the questioning continued. Finally, John Venables admitted, after two days of questioning, what they'd done on that day. And then he made what were the first admissions, and it was, yeah, OK, I killed the baby, I'm very sorry. Can you tell his mum I'm sorry, I think he said. Uh, and then, from then, he made uh, certain admissions, well, certainly that he was, he was present and inflicted some of the injuries caused on, on James. So Thompson's version of events that he told police was that the boys took James from the shopping centre, they walked around, took him onto the railway track, Thompson watched Venables assault this child, but then Thompson went home and he never took part in the assault, he never watched James die, he just, he was never a part of it, he was just watching. Meanwhile, Venables, as you've guessed, placed most of the blame on Thompson, saying that he was even throwing bricks at James. He took him on the rail and shot and started throwing bricks at him. And what, did it make him fall over? Yeah, he did fall over. And he just kept on getting back up again. He wouldn't stay down. What would you say while he was doing all this? He was saying, stay down, stupid dizzy and all like that. On top of Venable's verbal confession, there was also some very strong forensic evidence that proved that the boys did it. There was blood on Venable's shoe. Finally, police discovered exactly what happened that day in February. So the boys took James by the hand and led him out of the shopping centre, and that we already knew. They walked for almost three miles in total, James crying the whole time and the boys assaulting him the whole time. They were seen by over 38 people 
on this three mile walk. That is 38 people that could have intervened and saved this baby's life. That number does vary, although 38 is the most commonly believed number. It's somewhere between like two and 60, although 38 is like the number that was used in court and stuff. That is the most believed number. A couple of people did stop the boys and wonder what was going on and asked why James was bloody, why he was crying, but the boys had a story ready. Oh. He's fallen over, that's why he's got injuries on him. These are injuries that they'd inflicted. He's crying for his mother and we're taking her home to his mother was the story they told. Very cunning. But the boys didn't go straight to the railway line. That wasn't even a part of their plan to begin with. Their initial plan was to steal a child, go outside the strand and just push them in front of a car. But that didn't work. James wasn't even part of their initial plan to begin with. The boys had actually tried abducting another child earlier that day but the child's mother caught them before they could take him away. But the boys did successfully abduct James Bulger and so when their plan to push him in front of a car didn't work the boys decided to take him to the canal and there they were going to push him in and drown him but somehow it didn't work. I don't really know how this all played out but it didn't work pushing him into the canal so he somehow got dropped on his head by one of the boys and that was why he was bloody when people were passing they reported seeing a bloody little child that was crying and that was where the blood came from he got dropped on his head by this canal so now the boys first two plans hadn't worked so then they decided to take him up onto the railway line and once they were up on this railway the two boys tortured this little baby like sadistically horrifically tortured this little baby. Um, it's believed that Robert Thompson had more involvement in the torture and the assault of James. Um, although Venables did have his part in it, he was equally as sadistic and, and just awful as the other boy. So I'm not going to go into too much detail at all with this because it's just, it is one of the worst cases I've ever read about. I actually tweeted about it as I was researching this and I must have cried for about half an hour reading this stuff. It is all online if you want to go and do some further reading but I do warn you if you do that just please like if you're sensitive to this kind of stuff just don't look it up because it is the most horrific case of torture I have ever read about. Literally no one like this is such a well-known case in the UK everyone knows about it but no one talks about what those boys did to that baby. It's just unspoken of. It's not in any documentaries, news articles, just no one talks about it because it's just so heartbreaking and it's a baby. It was a baby. Like I said, it's such a well-known case in the UK and I am 19 years old now. I've known about this case all my life and when I was researching this for this video, that was the first time I've ever found out what these boys to did to that baby. It is that unspoken of. So I will put a timestamp on screen. Like I said I'm not going to go into too many details so don't worry about that if you do want to watch this bit but I will put a timestamp on screen in case you just don't want to hear about any of this at all. Um, but yeah I'm going to put in some clips and I'm going to talk about a little bit of what they did to him. James Bulger's official cause of death was beating. Um, these boys just beat him so badly and for so long and so viciously and they just tortured him for so long, so many different ways. Um, but his official cause of death was beating. The boys beat him and tortured him and then weighted him down on the railway track so that he couldn't get up and then they left and let him get hit by a train. James was hit by a train um, and he was cut in two, although it was believed that he was dead before he was hit by the train due to his injuries. The post-mortem showed that he had a lot of what are called split wounds or lacerations mainly to his head which were the result of being struck heavy blows with the bricks and the iron bar that were found at the scene. James's body must have just been in awful condition when he was found. Not only do I feel for James and his family and friends obviously but for that group of children that found him they must have found him in, in such a like scarring way that must have just been traumatic for those children to see that. It was believed that there was a sexual aspect to this crime and to this murder um, and like I said I'm not going to go into details but the way in which his body was found it was just obvious like all of his clothes from the waist down were removed and among other disturbing details of how his body was found it was just 
it's obvious. If you're aware of John Venables now, um, then it's pretty clear that there was probably a sexual aspect to this crime. If you don't know about any of that, don't worry, we'll get into it later in the video. Although both boys did claim that there was no sexual aspect to this crime whatsoever. Okay, so that's it. That's the details over. Um, if you did skip to this bit, hi, welcome back. Um, we're now on to like the trial and stuff. So both boys were subsequently charged with abduction, attempted abduction and murder. Abduction and murder for James Bulger and attempted abduction for the boy earlier that day. The boy's first appearance in court was just 10 days after the murder where the boys were just known as Child A and Child B. Um, because they were just 10 years old, their identities were at first protected from the public. Outside the court that day it was such a scene. There was hundreds of people that turned up outside that court to riot, throw things at the van, shout things, just express their general disgust and outrage and anger at this case. Like I said it was one of the most horrific cases anyone had ever heard of in UK history. It was just disgusting and so people turned up in their hundreds to try and express this anger. The boys trial was set to later that year where they would be sentenced and again over 500 people turned up to the court that day. There were queues outside the, uh, the court because there were 44 seats available for the public to listen in and uh, they'd be queuing up all night to get in. It was just like a show trial. And the dock in the courtroom where the boys would have been standing to do the trial actually had to be raised by 18 inches. They had to put a false floor in there because these were two 10 year old boys and they couldn't see over the railings because they were so tiny. I mean, you never expect to have 10 year olds in a courtroom for something like this. And that, that just shows it really, doesn't it? Like a courtroom is made for adults. It's not made for two 10 year old boys. In the UK, the criminal age of responsibility is 10 years old. These boys were both 10 years old. Had they been a few months younger than they were, these boys would have got off completely for this crime they just wouldn't have been charged it was in this trial that the details of that day before the abduction surfaced John Venables had actually been chosen to look after the school gerbils that week and so that day on the 12th of February he was on his way to school to pick up these gerbils on his way there he bumped into his best friend Robert Thompson in town and like we know the two of them often got into trouble together and Thompson managed to persuade Venables into going shoplifting with him that day. The two of them went to the Strand, they were shoplifting for a bit but they got bored, I mean they did that a lot and that was when Thompson turned to Venables and said let's grab a kid. So Venables forgot all about his gerbils, forgot that he was supposed to be going to school and after a failed attempt at abducting another child the two of them eventually abducted James Bulger. They walked him around for hours passing so many people, so many people that could have made a difference and saved this baby's life. A few of these people did stop the boys and ask them what they were doing, why this baby was crying, why he had blood on his head, but the boys had a story ready. They said that he was their little brother and he'd fallen over and they were just taking him home. On another occasion they were stopped by a woman walking her dog and she asked the same question like why is the baby crying, why has he got blood on his head? And they said that he was lost and they didn't actually know this little baby and they asked for directions to the nearest police station so that they could take him there. The woman gave them directions to the nearest police station and just left and let these two 10 year old boys take a baby to the police station. It came to light in these trials, like I said, that Thompson seemed to have the leading role in the abduction, the murder and in the torture of James Bulger although it was Venable's idea to take him up onto the railway line. Venable said in his trial that James Bulger seemed to like him more than Robert Thompson. He would let John pick him up, let him hold his hand, whereas he wouldn't let Thompson do any of that. Thompson and Venable's trial lasted 17 days and then a verdict was finally made. Both boys, then 11 years old, were found guilty of the murder of James Bulger, which made them the UK's youngest ever convicted murderers because they were 10 at the time of the murder and that is the youngest ever murderers in UK history. When they said they were guilty, Venables knew straight away and started to cry. Thompson looked at me and just glared at me. I just glared back at him. 
and then he realised that Venables was crying, so his behaviour changed and he started to cry. But I couldn't see any tears. The judge also made the controversial decision to release the boys' real names and the boys' school pictures so that the public could identify these two boys that had done all these things to this little baby. Something that is very rarely done with child criminals. I was always against their identity being revealed. Not because of John, I wasn't bothered one iota about John, but he had a family who was completely innocent, of course. Even though this was done, the judge also ruled that no more information about these two men as they grew up in prison and whatever, no more information could be leaked about them and that when they left prison they would be given new identities. Both boys were sentenced to eight years in prison. Eight years for the horrific, sadistic torture and murder of a baby. I'm sure pretty much like 99% of my audience will agree that eight years is not enough. If you look up the details of this crime, you will know that eight years is not enough for what they did to that little baby. And it's clear that they didn't feel remorse, they were laughing in court. So what are the chances of them getting out in eight years time when they're 18 years old, 19 years old, and re-offending? Like, the chances are pretty high of that. And this, as you can probably imagine, was met by complete outrage from the whole of the UK. And due to this, the boys' trials were actually reviewed and their sentencing was increased from eight years to ten years. Two more years. Everyone was in you know, uproar at the sentence that Thompson and Venables were given. Um, you know, I, I can't thank people enough for the way they've even back, they've still backed me to this day. A national newspaper in the UK called The Sun actually started a petition to try and get the boys' sentences increased further. And this petition got over 280,000 signatures. And it worked. The government increased the boys' sentences from 10 years to 15 years which a lot of people still believed was too short. I wasn't pleased with it, but I would have learned to live with it. I would have said, well, you know, at the end of the day, they, they have done 15 years, or going to do 15 years, you know, we can't ask for more than that. However, like I said, this second increase in the boys' sentences from 10 to 15 years was done by the government, not by criminal lawyers. And so it was deemed that it wasn't fair, the government didn't have a place to do that, and so their sentences were brought back down to 10 years. When I got brought back down when they said it wasn't down to Michael Howard to increase it, it was just another, another knife in the back. And I just thought, how much more can we take as, a fa as James's family? So now it had to be decided how the boys would be sentenced and rehabilitated, because without rehabilitation, like I said, they were likely to re-offend. Both boys were put into separate kind of child criminal rehabilitation units. It was like half prison, half rehabilitation, full of children. Um, and while both boys were there in separate places, it was reported that both of them were experiencing PTSD from the murder. Venables particularly was suffering pretty bad with post-traumatic stress. Um, he would have nightmares, he would have flashbacks. Thompson was experiencing it, but Venables was much more severe. Both boys had really secure accommodation, like they were always supervised. Doors would be locked before and after they would enter every room. So like they would go in, the door would be locked behind them. So no one could, none of the other prisoners, prisoners? Were they prisoners because they were children? But none of the other children in the unit could attack them. Both boys got a good education, they had nice food, they had TVs in their rooms with video games and movies. Honestly, it was more like a hostel than it was a prison. Like, these boys were doing time for torturing and murdering a baby and they were getting TVs and video games and movies. And I just thought, you know, what have I done since you say of this? You know, that they should be getting punished, not rewarded. Both boys were taught how to conceal their past and their real identities, as well as having one-to-one -one tuition to pass GCSEs and A-levels. There's one-on-one -on -one teaching. Um, you know, there's people who've got to pay for that kind of education. They got a scoffery. Like I said, it was like a hostel. These boys were getting more in this prison setting for torturing and murdering a baby. These boys had more than some poor families have. Like, some poor families don't have TVs, don't have video games or movies or one-to-one -one tuition for GCSEs and A-levels. Whereas these boys 
committed such a horrific crime and they were almost being rewarded for it. Went shopping for themselves as well, buying all kinds of designer clothes. You know, a lot of people out there work so hard and still can't afford things like that for their kids. But they, you know, they're good kids. But these two committed that crime and were given all luxuries like that, designer clothes, you know. I actually found an interview with a boy called Leon that was in Robert Thompson's unit at the same time as him. He, he actually spent five years in there with him. Um, he said that he knew who Robert Thompson was, everyone knew who he was, but his crime just wasn't spoken about in there. Like one time we was all just sat there and it come up on the news, I can't remember, it was a bar that showed you his picture. Like I remember the staff turned it off and he went like barging into his room and you could hear him like arguing with the staff. I can't remember what he was saying, he was just swearing at him and stuff like that. Thompson's room in this unit had a lot of luxuries for a prison cell you know for someone that is serving time for murder it just it literally looked like your average little boy's room not a prison cell we had like liverpool posters they had like pictures with like lava painted like matchstick people and stuff like that and he had like a liverpool duvet just had, had a foot spa in his room and like if he was lending the pc from education he used to have that in his room as well for and as you can imagine to keep two young boys under such accommodation where they get so much and they get like private tutors and they get a completely decorated bedroom you can imagine it is a lot of money to keep these boys where they were on average it costs somewhere in the region of three thousand pounds a week but i regard that as an investment for the future if i can affect positive change in a youngster return them safely to the community then perhaps we won't spend large sums of money by incarcerating them for the for the majority of their adult life. But it wasn't just the boys' lives inside the unit that was causing outrage. The boys were often let out of the unit to go shopping, go to football games, meet up with family. Thompson was first let on his first day out just a year into his sentence. A year after committing such a horrible crime, he was let out of prison for the day just to go for a walk around a park and as of then he would go on like monthly trips to the swimming baths. Swimming was his favourite hobby and so he used to go there every single month and they would get a McDonald's before returning to the unit. I used to know we went out because like I used to say to the staff, oh where have you been? I used to say oh been to the shopping centre with, with him, stuff like that, or to the park with him or wherever. Perhaps to a local shopping centre to buy the clothes that they need from the money that they're allowed, and that's that's about letting them. That's about preparing them for a return into the community. Which you know makes sense. Like they are trying to help these people prepare for life outside of the unit. Like obviously they're not going to be functioning members of society if they don't have this kind of help while they're in there. But I can't help but feel like they're taking the piss a bit. I'm sorry if I'm getting like unprofessional during this video. Just this bit of the case specifically just infuriates me. Like, I can't help but feel like these boys are being rewarded for torturing and murdering a baby. And they're getting all this. They're going out and buying designer clothes. They're going to McDonald's. They're going to the swimming baths. They're getting the bedroom decorated to their favourite football team. Like, I just... It just infuriates me, it really does. I mean, there's a difference between preparing them for real life, like taking them to a shop, maybe getting them to buy like a loaf of bread, handling money, you know, and just rewarding them, giving them luxuries that they just don't deserve. I just think it's disgusting. In 1999, when both boys were 16 years old, it was decided by the European court that their original trial in 1993 wasn't impartial. And due to this, the boys' sentences were once again reviewed. This review decided that the boys were then gonna be released just six months later. In June of 2001, both boys were released. They were given new identities, new names, new passports, birth certificates, all that, and they were put into new secret locations that no one knew about. I read on a couple of different sources about the price for giving someone a new identity. It can cost anywhere between £250,000 and £750,000 each for both of these men to be given a new identity and a new life after committing such a horrible crime. They were both prohibited from contacting each other if they ever found out each other's new identities. They were prohibited from contacting James Bulger's family. Um, they weren't allowed in the whole Merseyside area. And Merseyside is a county. It's a big area. They're not allowed in the whole of Merseyside. 
Um, and other than reporting to a parole officer every so often, they were free men. They couldn't get in touch with any of the family, myself or any of the family. Um, so I thought, you know, it's a bit of, bit of comfort, but I thought, well, hang on, does that mean to say I'm a prisoner in Merseyside? Can't I venture out to Merseyside then, in case I bump into one or...? Both boys were released when they were 18 years old, and other than doing time in that little pathetic hostel situation, they never did any real prison time. They never went to an adult prison. They never truly paid for what they did to that little boy. Over three different people, I could only find examples of three, but I know for a fact there's been more. Three different people at least have had jail time for sharing pictures and profiles of who they believe is John Venables and Robert Thompson's new identities. So sharing photos of John Venables now. Just a side note while we're on this kind of topic, in 2016 a woman was jailed for messaging Denise Bulger or Denise Fergus on Twitter pretending to be one of the killers and even pretending to be James's ghost. I just thought that was kind of interesting information to put in, like how sick must you be to message someone who's lost their son and pretend to be their ghost? Like, So, nine years after his release in 2010, John Venables actually re-offended and it was all over the media. It was, it, this was huge news. Due to this, his actual cause of arrest, like the reason he was arrested, was kept secret. It wasn't public information. But as you can imagine, there was a lot of public backlash, as there always is in stuff like this. And once again, the courts went back on their word and actually did release it. The police were called into his flat or apartment, wherever he was living. They went through his computer, which Venables tried to snatch the computer off them and tried to smash it up into bits. As quick as he is, the police managed to get the computer off him. And that's when they found all the child porn on it. The person formerly known as John Venables was charged with possession and distribution of indecent images of children. He had downloaded over 57 indecent images of children over a 12-month period and was actually sharing them and downloading them and posting them on a paedophile network. He pled guilty to this like he knew he was guilty and he was sentenced to two years in prison. During this trial, however, it came out that Venables had been violating the terms of his release the whole time, since 2001, for nine years since he got let out. Venables was reported drinking in Liverpool in nightclubs. He's been reported into going to Everton Games, which is only five minutes away from where I'm living, because I've been sitting right next to him. I could have spoke to him. I could have even had a drink with him. I don't know. I've got nieces who drink in Liverpool. How do I know that any of my nieces haven't been chatted up by Venables? It also came out that he'd been arrested twice before since his release. Once for a drunk fight and once for possession of drugs. It was decided once again that his new identity was not going to be released to the public, although it was clear that he was a danger to society, like he was still re-offending and for some pretty dangerous stuff as well. In 2005, after Venable's release, his probation officer reported meeting his girlfriend at the time, who was 17 years old. He was 23, so this wasn't a huge age gap. It was oh, six years, and especially when you're that young, it's kind of a big age gap. But on top of that, it just is illegal. <laughs> like, a sexual relationship between someone that is over 18 and someone that is younger than 18 just is illegal. Venables dated many young girls, teenage girls, like 17, 18, 19 year old girls while he was in his 20s. People believe that he was just trying to like live his adolescence. It was like a delayed adolescence since he was in prison for all of his. Well, I say prison, but he was in a borderline hostel with video games, TVs, movies, whatever. It wasn't a prison. As Venable's supervision gradually decreased, like he was seeing his probation officer less and less, he began violating the terms of his release. Once again, he was excessively drinking, taking drugs, downloading child pornography images, as well as visiting Merseyside. On two different occasions, Venables actually revealed his true identity to two different people. And so because of this, because his true identity was gonna get out, he was given another new identity in 2011. He was kept in prison between 2011 and 2013 for his own safety, so that because police feared that he would share his new, new identity, and like I said, it costs a lot of flipping money to give someone a new identity. So police were like, if you're just going to go out and tell people, 
we're keeping you in prison. You are not telling people your new identity. In February of 2018, so just two months ago, well not even two months ago, like one and a half months ago, John Venables pled guilty to possession of indecent images of children for a second time. He admitted to being in possession of 392 category A, 148 category B and 630 category C child porn images. So if you're not sure what that means, in a nutshell, category A includes penetration, which he had almost 400 of. B is non-penetrative sexual activity, which he had almost 150. And C is any other kind of indecent child images that is not sexual activity. So anything that doesn't fall under those first two categories, which he had 630. John Venables was sentenced to a further three years and four months in prison. And that is where we're at now. That is the current day he is in prison. I believe that Robert Thompson was successfully rehabilitated and he hasn't offended since. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I really, I, like, I didn't find anything. So let's hope he has been. Like I said, the boys didn't show remorse. So what are the chances of him reoffending? I mean, John Venables is a prime example that if you don't rehabilitate properly, if you just give them a freaking video game console, then they will reoffend. I mean, I personally don't know much about the law, I'll be honest, but it just takes common sense, doesn't it? Like, if you can do a crime that horrific to another human being, like, it's clear that you're gonna need some help to get back to the mental state of a normal human being because you can't be mentally sound in your head to be able to do that to someone else. Like, there's got to be some degree of mental illness for you to be able to carry that out and to further show no remorse. Like, there must have been some degree of mental illness in those boys. And so without rehabilitation, without counselling, without help, those boys are going to go on to reoffend. Um, and they did. Well, one of them did. But yeah, that is it for this case. I normally put my own little opinions in the end, but I just feel like it's really, like, unnecessary, kind of inappropriate for this kind of case. It's a very hard-hitting case, and I just... I don't know, I just kind of want to leave it there. Um, but I mean, during this video, you have been seeing my opinions coming out. I... this case just infuriates me. It really does. Like, I'm tearing up right now. <laughs> this, for me, this case is the most upsetting true crime case I have ever heard in my entire life, for me personally. Like, every time I watch a documentary, every time I just think about it, I just cry. <laughs> like, I just cry and cry. My mum as well, ever since this happened, I think it's been like 30 years or something almost now, every single time this would come on the news, every, every single time someone would talk about it, my mum just can never listen to it. She has to turn the TV off. Like, when I was researching this case, me and my auntie were talking about it in the living room and my mum had to leave the room. Like, my mum has never been able to listen to any of this because it affects her so much as well. Um, and it's like that for the majority of the UK. If you're not from here, like, everyone is just so affected by this case. Like, every single time I see a picture of that little boy, I just cry and you don't understand how many pictures I saw during this, during my research. But yeah, let me know what you think down below. I would love to know your opinions on so many different things from this. Like, what are your opinions on the boys' um, prison life? What are your opinions on the whole, like, giving them new identities and protecting their identities and stuff? Do you think that the, their identities should have been let out in the first place? Do you think that they shouldn't have been given new identities? I'm really interested to know what you guys think. And since this was a requested case, let me know any other cases that you might want me to cover down, down in the comments. I'm always taking suggestions from you guys. I'm always covering cases that you guys want to see. So if you don't let me know, I won't know. But yeah, that completes this video. Thank you so, so much for watching. I feel like it's been a very long one, but thank you for sticking around. If you enjoyed it, make sure you leave a big thumbs up and subscribe down below if you want to see some more content like this. I upload a true crime or an unsolved mystery video every Wednesday and every Sunday. I also, if you're new to this channel, I do a themed week every month, which is coming in about two weeks, I think, one and a half weeks, um, where I do a true crime video every single day for a week and it has a different theme every month. And I do have a theme ready for this month, so get ready. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching. Make sure you subscribe if you want to see some more from me. And I will see you in the next one.